guys. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you today. Uh, our discussion is going to focus on the Second Amendment. We're going to look at the language of the Second Amendment and how it is that the Supreme Court determines whether a violation of the Second Amendment has actually occurred. Now, on our Moodle site, I have updated the Google Slides that have um, all of the amendments on there and, and the, the slides that we've been looking at every single day. And what I'd ask is that you quickly go and look at the Google slide related to the Second Amendment or pull out your pocket constitution and actually read the language of the Second Amendment. Because I think many people tend to overlook the language and they go to the phrase that they're familiar with, the right to bear arms, but they don't actually look at the entire amendment. And so I'm going to ask that you take a second and do that. Um, so make sure that you press pause on a way that you can contort my face in a funny way. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the Second Amendment. You know, the Second Amendment is incredibly controversial, um, and it, it triggers feelings for many Americans. And yet I find this so interesting, and so many legal uh, constitutional scholars do, because while it might seem um, that the Second Amendment is uh, unclear, the reality is it's not very unclear. Um, but I think what this speaks to in a lot of ways is how government will use the Second Amendment to create emotional feelings and uh, lobbyists or interest groups concerned about protecting the Second Amendment will use the language to get their members um, interested and kind of um, engaged in the conversation. So um, it really isn't a need for the Second Amendment to be quite as controversial as it appears to be because um, the Supreme Court actually rarely addresses the amendment. Um, there's very few times in American history this isn't like free speech when we're trying to parcel out what's free speech and what's not speech and what is hate speech and what is symbolic speech and what about speech in a classroom. No, it's not the case. They really don't hear a lot of Second Amendment cases, um, and there's a reason for that. There really, really is. So um, let's talk a little bit about the Second Amendment and some of the questions associated with it. So if you have your Constitution with you or you have the um, the uh, slide up, one of the things that we look at is um, the fact that the Second Amendment potentially has two different clauses associated with it. And I'm going to grab my Constitution. Okay. So some people think that there's two clauses here, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So is a well-regulated militia a separate clause from the right of the people to, to keep and bear arms? Or is the intent that they go together? And quite frankly, let's look at this thing. It's not a well-written sentence whatsoever. So the fact that it's written in the way that it is creates a little bit of controversy. So are the people, the right of the people, are the people um, individuals? And if they are, what constitutional scholars call this is the individual right theory. The individual right theory. And that's sort of the theory that a lot of people are talking about today, the right of you and you and you and you to have um, your own weapons. Or... Does this actually mean that Congress cannot legislate away a state's right to maintain its militia or its arms? Now, wait to think about that for a second. You, I'm sure most of you in this room, have thought about the Second Amendment about your right to have a weapon, right? Or what's called the individual rights theory. But there is a camp of constitutional scholars who look at this and say, Mm, you know what it could mean? That a well-regulated militia cannot be infringed, right? And that the, those individuals, the rights of the people, are the people who are in the militia, right? The people who belong to the militia which live in the state. And we know a militia is a military in a state. Today we call that the National Guard. So is that's a whole different way of thinking about the Second Amendment, and most of us, I'm sure, in this room have never thought about the Second Amendment in that perspective. But like I said, there's a whole encampment of people who see it this way. Um, and we, again, we call that the collective rights theory. So I'll review. There are two theories on how to view the Second Amendment. There's the individual rights theory, the theory that most of you are familiar with. And then there's the collective rights theory, 
this idea that every state has a right to a well-regulated militia, and that the Second Amendment isn't about you, the individual, having guns in your home, but rather about the state's militia being able to arm itself properly. So let's talk about the history of the Second Amendment when it comes to the Supreme Court. Um, and in 1939, we see an example um, of really the first case regarding the Second Amendment coming into the hands of the Supreme Court. And this is the case of U.S. v. Miller. U.S. v. Miller, which is not in your case brief book. Okay, it's not in your case brief book. So, um, in U.S. v. Miller, we actually see the Supreme Court look at the collective rights theory. Remember, and that's about the right of the state to be able to have its weapons. So, um, what had happened? Well, there was a law in 1934 called the National Firearms Act. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why this law is created as it is. Um, but the National Firearms Act says that uh, a sawed-off shotgun um, cannot be transferred from state to state. In fact, it made sawed-off shotguns illegal. So um, the National Firearms Act allowed Congress to regulate a sawed-off shotgun that had moved in interstate commerce. And um, the evidence was that the sawed-off shotgun was necessary to preserve a well-regulated militia. I'll say that again in a way that maybe might be more clear. The Supreme Court has to examine, is that sawed-off shotgun necessary for a well-regulated militia? Go back to my initial point. We're talking about the collective rights theory, not the right of the individual to have one. But does a well-regulated militia need a sawed-off shotgun? And the Supreme Court says, no. They don't, need ne they don't necessarily need a sawed-off shotgun. They have other alternatives for weapons which could be used in 1934 um, or thereafter in order to have the weapon that they needed. Uh, you don't have to have a sawed-off shotgun. It can be a different type of weapon. Um, and that's for a long time, the last time that the court dealt with, um, with the Second Amendment. We see a couple examples of the Second Amendment in a case called U.S. v. Lopez, uh, which is about gun-free zones, um, but we really don't see a whole lot of modern, uh, a lot of cases until 2008. And in 2008, a case comes to the Supreme Court called D.C. versus Heller, and the D.C. of course is the District of Columbia, the nation's capital. And this is again 2008. Uh, and in this case, the Supreme Court decides that they are going to look at the individual rights theory, the right of an individual um, to bear arms. And the argument is um, that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to, to have um, weapons as they want to. Uh, and also says, you know, trigger locks are unconstitutional. Mandating trigger locks is unconstitutional is what the court uh, examines. And again, that's because it's about your individual right to have a weapon. Um, a case comes to the Supreme Court again in 2010, and it's called McDonald versus Chicago, and it's about the right of Chicago to... Um, to make uh, weapons illegal, with uh, guns illegal within their um, within the boundaries of the city. And that one, I believe, is in your Supreme Court case book. So please, please make sure that you look at McDonald versus Chicago. Uh, and this is when the Second Amendment is incorporated to the states. So keep in mind, guys, that it's not until 2010 that the Second Amendment is incorporated to the states. The Second Amendment is the last amendment to be incorporated to the states under incorporation theory or selective incorporation theory. So what is my point here today? My point is, is there's a couple different ways to look at the Second Amendment. Um, and initially, that collective theory was the way um, that the court looked at it. And then they transitioned most recently into looking at the individual rights theory when it came to the Second Amendment. Um, please make sure that you familiarize yourself with McDonald v. Chicago. Very important case in your case book. So I'm going to ask that you spend a little bit of effort and review it. Um, and then you're going to see some articles and some news pieces, uh, which the sub is hopefully going to chat with you about, that I want you to look at regarding, um, regarding the Second Amendment as well. Particularly the case of smart guns and whether smart guns uh, are a violation of the Second Amendment or not. So uh, I'll see you soon. I look forward to seeing you on Friday. And if you have any questions, you know that you can always email me because I'm easily available uh, at my Google training. All right. Talk to you guys soon. Bye.